welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. The idea of eating flavorful, covetous food, all the while maintaining a healthy body, initially seems impossible. But indeed, as I'll share with you today in, in today's podcast, it can be your reality. You can in, sit down and enjoy a meal in the morning and for lunch and for dinner and not feel deprived and still wear those clothes that you want to wear, feel your most confident self in the body that you have, and be healthy. It's possible. It's, it's something that um, I thought you had to deprive yourself to get to with regards to the body part. And um, it took a lot of time for me to figure this out. Um, but after reading a, more than a handful of books that, were, that spoke about research and health and the effect of certain foods on the body and talking with my own doctor, as well as going through all sorts of mistakes um, in my teens, 20s, and uh, maybe my, a little bit of my early 30s, I have found a way to live this paradox. I'm by no means doing it perfectly. And there's so many more people that are doing it really well. But I wanted to share today these 10 simple ways you can love food and love your body at the same time. So on the blog, I've talked about a lot of the things that I am going to share with you on the podcast today, but what I haven't done is shared more personal experiences and um, instances um, from which I'm gathering this information. So you're going to get to know me a little bit on this podcast more than you have on the blog. Now, by no means am I a doctor, so do be sure to talk to your nutritionist or doctor before you do any changes to your diet. But what I hope you gather from today is there are simple ways that you can go about your everyday routine that will, with patience, create not, it's not, and it's not about, it's not about trying to fit into those genes. I know I prefaced it by saying that, but it's really about taking care of this one machine that you have, this only machine you have to make it through your one unique life. And when we shift that mindset, I think it's really powerful. At least it has been for me. It took me a while to get to that shift. I knew it. I've known it, um, since we started talking about biology and science and, and, you know, grade school and, and middle school, but the reality of it, the reality that, life could end really quickly, or it could be diminished if I don't take care of my body. Um, once I realized that in my late twenties and early thirties, it was like a light switch, a light switch. And, and I wish I had gotten to that point sooner, but I didn't. And I'm here now. And, um, anyway, I'd like to share those 10 simple ways to fall in love with food and fall in love without the guilt, um, so that you can go about your business, your everyday routines, and know that what you eat is going to fuel you and help you be your best, but also so you can generally sit down and appreciate what you're putting into your body. All right. So let's get started. Let's talk about those 10 simple ways that you can eat well and feel great in the body you have. Now, in my book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, I talk about the six pillars of lasting good health. And two of those six pillars focus entirely on food. One, eat what you want, but in moderation. And two, choose quality food. So I'm going to dive into those two pillars and really break them down in today's podcast. So number one of the 10 simple ways is to make water your drink of choice. Now, this doesn't mean that you can't have a glass of wine. This doesn't mean you can't have some orange juice in the morning or have milk. This is not to say that, but what it is is almost this default, this light switch that goes off whenever you're thirsty, whenever you're craving liquids, or whenever someone asks you, what do you want to drink? Just immediately have that switch, that default that says, water, please, water, please. (laughs) I mean, it sounds boring, but it's so simple and it has such a tremendously positive effect on your skin, on flushing those toxins out of your system that your body needs to wring out regularly um, so that number one, you don't get sick, so that any kind of tumor or cancer or anything can't even start to even think about forming if it might do so. Now, granted, we have genetic dispositions to various things. This is not to say that, but anything we can do that's in our power to help our body do what it's 
supposed to do is, is huge. So, and that first thing is to simply drink water. If you want to add some flavor, add some lemon, add some lime. Um, there's all sorts of things you can add to it for a little flavor, add fresh herbs. Um, that's a great, simple way of doing it. Add a little mint leaves, very simple things, to add a little flavor, but you know, cold water, I can't tell you some of the most, one of the most refreshing things. And it is a simple luxury because often it's free and it's convenient. So not only are you saving your budget, but you're helping your health out. So that is something to just kind of make a default. Like I said, it doesn't have to be your only drink of choice. It's just the default choice, the default choice. Now, in in one of the habits, and I think I've talked about this before um, on the blog, is when I was reading uh, the body book by Cameron Diaz. And I know it's like Cameron Diaz, she's not a writer. She's not, but she actually did write a decent book and it was, uh, it did make it to the top of the New York times bestseller li- list in the health section. And she wrote it with the assistance of, um, one of her nutritionists and, or doctors. And one of the habits that she uses or follows is this, um, simple routine of going to bed with, um, a bottle of water. So she drinks a lot of water right before bed. And then she has a bottle of water on her nightstand um, or in her, re- her bathroom, ready to go when she wakes up to, f- to f- hydrate her body. So number one, you're hydrating, hydrating, hydrating. And some people are going, wait a second, Shannon, I'll be up going to the bathroom constantly. Now, I'm not saying this will work for everyone, but it's something that I have found has helped me to stay more hydrated because I drink a lot before bed. I drink a lot in the morning and I'm not so parched throughout the day. I'm not unnecessarily hungry. Um, and it's a simple habit. Not that I can't, I'm not, I should be drinking water throughout the day. Absolutely. But this is something that kind of sets that balance, um, that where it needs to be, um, before I head out and get the day going. And then I get busy sometimes the day and I don't drink as much as I should. So at least I know for sure at the end and at the beginning of my day, I've hydrated. So it's just a simple little habit habit, a little suggestion, something to consider. All right. Number two is to listen to your body. Our body knows what it needs. We just have to figure out the language in which it is communicating with us. We need to figure out what it is asking for. And oftentimes when we haven't been in tune, I guess you could say with our body for a long time or ever, we get frustrated because we think we need just quick fixes or we'll grab cookies out of a jar that have been from the store that are just full of filler and they don't actually satiate or actually give us protein or fiber, something that actually our body is craving. What made me think about this, about what my body wanted was when I was in my, probably in my twenties, most of my twenties, I would wake up in the middle of the night more often than not. And I would want to eat. I'd be hungry. I mean, generally hungry. And because I was somewhat well, I wasn't completely awake. I didn't have the willpower to stop myself. And so I would go and eat whatever was available in the fridge. I wouldn't eat a lot. I would just eat a snack or something, but it was never something that I really, truly needed. Number one, number two, I always ask myself, why do I always wake up hungry? Well, now I don't wake up hungry in the middle of the night. And the main difference, the only difference, number one is that I'm feeding my body what it needs and what it wants during the day. So when I go to sleep at night, it's not crying out. It's not waking me up. And I think once we figure out, once we figure out that yes, our body needs a healthy balance of protein, carb, and fats, our body knows what it needs. We, we have to be the ones to sit down and learn to communicate with it and listen to it and listen to it. Most importantly, we have to understand how to satiate our body. We have to understand how to feed it appropriately and give it what it needs. And there's a handful of books I will list on the show notes that will have those books that talk about various aspects of how to fuel your body. All right. So that's number two. Just learn to listen to your body. Learn to listen. Number three, eliminate processed foods. Whether you subscribe to a vegan, a paleo, a vegetarian, or any other particular eating regimen, simply refuse to eat anything out of a box or a bag, something that does not have an expiration date in the near future. If you can try to kind of just step away from that habit of grabbing something out of a bag or a box, you'll be amazed at where that pushes you to go when you're in the supermarket. It's going to push you for the most part to the edges, to the aisles, and yes, that those, that food is going to expire probably in the next few days, 
but it's going to be food that's not going to have all those additives and all those foreign different things that you have no clue how to pronounce. And it is a little bit more expensive. And that's, that's the struggle here. And I think that's also what was frustrating for me in my twenties is that I didn't have enough food, um, excuse me, money to go and buy fresh food every day or, or, you know, when I needed it. And so I would buy what I could so that I could eat, (laughs) but I could also keep my budget intact. And that's the tricky balancing part. But, but this is where it actually, you can do it. If you recognize what or how to cook food or make food that is of fresh ingredients and you satiate your body, you're not going to need as big a portion. So you're not going to need as much food. You're not going to need as much food to eat because you will be satiated more quickly and thus you'll be eating less. And it's just, it just kind of, it's a cycle and it, and it, it's a good cycle if you can figure out how to get on that. So Stay away from the box foods, stay away from the packaged foods, and try to push yourself out into the aisles, into those farmer's markets, grabbing that fresh food, learning how to cook. And your waistline and even your mind will thank you. All right. Number four is something that is going to be a shift for a lot of people. It was a shift for me, and it's simply to reduce added sugars. Don't worry, I'm not going to say eliminate all sugars. It's all about moderation. It really is. But it's being aware of what sugar, refined sugar, does to our body and our brains. And when you find out what an excess amount can do, you will shift. I actually was talking with my doctor last year um, on my yearly visit. And I said, okay, so tell me about the brain. Tell me how I can try to be as healthy as possible. I don't want Alzheimer's is basically what I was freaking out about. But in all honesty, though, I was, I was asking her for some advice on the power of food on the brain and the body. And she said, go read The Grain Brain. And she said, there's, yes, it's, it's, it's a best-selling book. Okay, but just because it's best-selling doesn't mean... Um, we should read it often the best books out there are the ones that very few people find but she said there's a lot of intriguing science that cannot be dismissed from a biological standpoint cannot be dismissed and so I did I took it I bought it and I got it brought it home and it's marked up like crazy as you might imagine but one of the things that I really took notice was when the conversation shifted to fructose and I just want to share with you really quickly. So it's called The Grain Brain by um, da, 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 David Pullmutter. Um, and one of the things he talks about is the effect of sugar on our liver. And this idea that when we, when we eat too much sugar, too much sugar. And remember, we're not just talking cookies here. We're talking pasta. We're talking breads. We're talking cereals. We're talking wine, um, alcohol, right? All those different components, ketchup has tons of sugar in it, depending on if you buy it off the shelf or make it yourself. Sugar is in a lot of different things that we don't even know it's there. And I think just being aware of where the sugar is that we eat is significant. But what one of the things that he points out, supported by different studies, is that two key hormones in regulating our metabolism, diets high in fructose lead to obesity and its metabolic repercussions. So when we increase our added sugar, we actually are numbing or slowing down our body's ability to say you're full, you're full based on how the body is processing that sugar. And again, I'm not a, I'm not a, a doctor or a scientist, but it's fascinating. It's fascinating to at least read it and consider it. I, I encourage you to at least read it and consider it um, because it at least puts a pause on, on, wait a second, what am I eating? what's in it and why do I want another piece what is in or not in this cake or cookie or whatever this bowl of pasta that makes me want to eat more shouldn't I be satiated with just a smaller portion there's a there's just certain elements of how the food is made and I think once you figure out that component and how you can throw in some protein and throw in some vegetables that it actually will be a more satiating meal and you'll be able to have some of what you love that pasta that bread or whatnot okay number five we're going to get away from the whole doctor spiel and we're just going to talk about how you're stocking your house so number five is change your options In other words, change what's readily available to you, what's in arm's length, what's in your cupboards, what's in your fridge, what's in your desk at work. What are you going to do to give yourself the best options when you are hungry? Because 
I mean, as much as we want to eat at a certain time every single day, our schedules are not going to allow it all the time. That would be ideal and that'd be wonderful, but it's just not going to happen. So we need to be preventative. And that takes planning. That takes takes some time on the front end, but we'll be so thankful when we have almonds to reach for at work instead of chocolate. Hershey's Kisses or something along those lines. In her book, Fit to Live, Dr. Pamela Peek actually reiterates this power of just stocking our cupboards with the food that we should be stocking it with. When we do that, we make it simpler to choose wisely, which ultimately we're just looking to be filled up. We're looking to be um, our, satisfy our hunger. And as long as we have the right food, our hunger will be satisfied and we'll walk away without the guilt. All right. A few things that I've done, that have been doing for the last couple of years is that on every Sunday I go to the grocery store for my weekly shopping trip and I pick up some vegetables. Depends on the season, obviously, and depends on how much time I have for chopping, but I'll sometimes pick up carrots or radishes, even broccoli, I eat raw broccoli, anything that's just easy to snack on, cucumber bites, things like that. And I'll spend 30 minutes to an hour on Sunday just chopping everything up putting them in a container in the fridge. And I just grab a handful each day, put it in a baggie and take it to work. It's my afternoon snack or snack throughout the day when I just need something to nosh on that'll satiate me just enough to get me to the next meal. That's one idea. Another snack that I like having on hand is roasted unsalted almonds. Absolutely love them. You don't need that much. I actually have a canister at my work. It's full of almonds. I think it's really low right now. I need to go stock it up. But it's my go-to after lunch, about two or three o'clock when I'm hungry and I just need something, something. All right, add some raisins to that maybe if you want a little different texture, different different flavor. Um, But plan ahead plan ahead. And I actually will share some blog posts that I've used in the past um, with some ideas on how to stock your cupboards and your desk drawers um, in a way that's mindful and will satiate your hunger. All right. We've just talked about the first five simple ways to not only love food, but love your body. I'm going to take a quick one minute intermission and I will see you on the other side. Welcome back. Let's talk about the remaining five of simple ways to eat where you can love food and also love the body that it cultivates. All right. So number six is to retrain your mind. And what I mean by that is this concept of eliminating grazing and simply eating the three basic meals plus one snack. Now you may be thinking, well, that's impossible. I don't know what my schedule is going to be like, I don't know if I can. The thing about it is if you eat properly, if you're eating healthy and balanced meals, real food, quality food, not processed food, not added sugar, then you will find that this is very, very possible. It's all about training your mind and your body. And so check out the book, Eating Mindfully by Susan Albers, or you can even check out Women for All, excuse me, French Women for All Seasons by Muriel Giuliano. They both reveal and show that this indeed can become your new habit. You can have those breaks between lunch, dinner, breakfast, and still feel you have enough energy to get through your day. That one snack, depending on when you eat dinner, is probably a really good idea. But again, quality food allows this to be a reality. And I found this to be very true, especially if I make sure I incorporate a little bit of protein, fiber in the morning to keep me going till lunch. It's very possible. All right, number seven is to sit down. Let go of the multitasking habit. Put your phone away. I can remember the last time I was at Paris, I sat down for lunch at this beautiful little cafe outside, 
and very cozy, sitting really close to everybody as you do. And it was in the Marais. And I simply had, by habit, I was eating by myself. I had my cell phone out. And I had it on the table. And I wasn't actually even using it. I was just put it on the table because I knew I probably would want to use it once I order, placed my order and was waiting for my food. Because I actually had some notes I had to take because I had been doing a project um, and touring some um, apartments for the blog. Anyway, my waiter, very frankly, <laughs> comes out and says, please put your cell phone away. And as I looked at him, and I was like, first of all, that would never happen in America. Number two, I wanted to say thank you. I really did. If we just will focus on the eating, on the people we're sitting down to have a conversation with, so many more amazing things can come out of it. But if we're multitasking, nothing gets our full attention and we don't have any quality experiences. And when we eat without multitasking, we're focusing on the food, we're allow, allowing ourselves to slow down and we are becoming more satiated because we're taking more time and we're not eating so quickly that we forget what we've eaten. Studies have shown that after 20 minutes, our brain can register whether we're full or not, full or not. but it does take approximately 20 minutes for our brain to register this. And so if we sit down and scarf down a meal in four or five minutes while we're devouring our latest social media on our cell phones, we number one, haven't enjoyed the food, so it's wasted in that way, but number two, it's wasted because we want more and we don't appreciate what we've already put in our bodies. So something to think about. Number seven, sit down and enjoy meals. All right. Number eight is eat local and eat in season. Let's talk about in season. First of all, Muriel Giuliano talks about this in a French one for all seasons. This idea that just because we want to have asparagus in the winter or in the fall doesn't mean we get to have it. In fact, we probably would appreciate it more by waiting for it when it comes in season in the spring, because it will have more flavor. And when we eat it in season, we're eating our food that has less added extra ingredients and unnecessary sugars to enhance the flavor that doesn't exist naturally. So we actually are helping our health in a variety of ways there. Also, choosing to eat local, for example, going to your local bakery, a lot of the times the breads check with your baker on this one, but the one that I go to, they don't add additives to their bread. So no, it won't last as long as your house, but you also are going to have those extra components that in various studies have attributed to all sorts of things we don't want to put in our bodies. So trying to buy locally to eat in season, actually, while it does take time and it may cost a little bit more money, is actually investment in our health. So something to keep in, in mind there for there was back when I was a kid, for example, with regards to buying locally, we would buy our milk. My mom would buy our milk from a local um, gentleman who had a few dairy cows and we would get it in a glass, a glass gallon. And there would be like three inches of cream on top of the milk. And that would be our milk. And I just remember as a kid, and I don't know how long we did this, but as a young kid thinking, okay, so we get our milk from straight from the cow. But there's no hormones, extra hormones hormones added into that. And you're getting rich nutrients, which is what you need from the milk in the first place. Um, and it just makes a tremendous difference. And you're also supporting, obviously, a local farmer, which is not a bad idea either. So something to think about with number eight, eat local and eat in season. Number nine is to savor small portions. When you slow down, as we were talking about with not multitasking, sitting down to eat your meals. When you slow down, you're actually allowing yourself to truly taste and appreciate the food. Consequently, when you slow down, you decrease the number of calories you consume and those 20 minutes arrive faster telling your brain that you are full so you are not going to consume more. This also allows you to enjoy the company you're with and you can dive into that conversation. You can also really investigate those flavors that are in the food. I can remember a few times I love sitting down with another foodie, a fellow foodie, and we'll dive into dishes and we'll try to figure out, okay, what, what herb are they using here? What spice are they using here? What's that ingredient? And it's like a mini mystery right there at the dining, the dinner table. And you feel like you're putting your Sherlock Holmes cap on. You're figuring out, I know it sounds cheesy, um, but it's kind of fun. And, but if you're going too quickly and devouring your food, 
that's not going to happen. And when you're able to slow down, you can just have small portions because you will be satiated after a small portion as long as it's made of quality food. So something to try, something to think about. Last but not least, number 10 is to fall in love with food again. Food is not our enemy. Going on various diets that restrict you from eating certain foods is something that you will have a difficult time doing for the rest of your life. At least that's been my experience. And if you can understand the power of food, what it does, what it can do for your body and your brain, and if you use or eat too much, what it can do detrimentally to your body, your brain, you are enhancing your life. And you're not making food the enemy, you're making it a necessary partner as you go about living the life of your dreams. And in order to live the life of your dreams, you must be at your best, you must be at your fullest potential. And at the core of that is being healthy. And how do you make sure that happens? A big part of that is what you put in your body, as we all know. So something to think about. It is possible, it is absolutely possible to fall in love with food again. So there you have it, 10 simple ways You can fall in love with food at the same time, actually decreasing your waistline, improving your health, and ultimately improving your life. None of these tricks are something that as soon as you do them the first day, everything's going to improve. These are things that with consistency, you will eventually see the positive effects that you are searching for. Maybe a couple months, maybe more than a couple months, but it will pay off and it won't be something that can be easily reversed. And in doing that, you've created habits that are established in how to live well. And that really is what living simply, simply luxuriously is about. It's about living well, choosing quality over quantity in all things. And so that you can appreciate and enjoy the life that you are trying to live, void of all the unnecessary. All the books and links that I mentioned throughout the podcast will be available on the show notes, www.thesimplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast eight. So if you're looking for those, you can head on over there and find everything you're looking for. Now, stay tuned for this week's Petit Plaisir when I share a simple recipe. We are talking about food after all today, right? A simple recipe that is my go-to appetizer that's full of flavor and is always a guest favorite. All right, in this week's Petit Pleasure, I'm going to tantalize your taste buds. This, like I said in the previous segment, is one of my favorite appetizers ad nauseum to the point where people pretty much know that if I'm going to have appetizers, I'm going to have this, but you know what? They don't seem to be complaining because they're always gone and they're really good. So, um, they're so simple though. I think that's part of why I love it. And they involve fresh ingredients in the summertime and into early fall, which is always good. But then again, you add cheese to it and everything's fine. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I haven't gotten to the name of the recipe, the recipe, (laughs) the recipe is simply basil, mozzarella, and tomato bruschetta or caprese bruschetta, um, because you're combining those three uh, iconic elements. So the ingredients are simply the freshest baguette you can get, so preferably that day, crunchier the better, sliced on the bias, all right? Then you want tomatoes, your choice, your preference. Um, For looks-wise, maybe get a handful of different colors of tomatoes. For flavor, I love heirloom tomatoes. Those are my favorite. Then make sure you have fresh mozzarella sliced. Make sure you have extra virgin olive oil. And if you can, get basil infused extra virgin olive oil. Just add that little extra flavor of basil since you're going to be using basil on the bruschetta. With the basil, you want to julienne it. All right, so get a few basil leaves and julienne it. And then, and this is the finishing ingredient, and I highly recommend you invest in this, top quality balsamic vinegar. If you don't have a balsamic vinegar that is thick like syrup, then I'm going to show you in the recipe um, steps how to reduce that so you can have it. It's very simple. All right. So you have all your ingredients. Go ahead and preheat your oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit while the, uh, the, while the oven is heating up. Slice your baguette. Take out a baking sheet or a jelly roll sheet and put down parchment paper. Put out your slices on the parchment paper. 
drizzle a little bit of EVOO or extra virgin olive oil on each piece. Just a drizzle, don't cover it. Then place a slice of mozzarella on each slice. Once the oven is ready, go ahead and put the, the baking sheet in the oven. And you'll probably leave it in there between two to five minutes. So watch it carefully because all you're doing is waiting for that cheese to, to melt and to bubble. All right. And that really doesn't take that long. Once that's done, go ahead and take it out and then you'll be able to finish and dress it up while it's in the oven. What you can be doing is julianning the basil. You can also be chopping your tomatoes. If you need to reduce your balsamic vinegar, you can do that now as well. To reduce balsamic vinegar, take about a fourth a cup, put it in a small saucepan over medium heat, and let it sit there and simmer it, stirring it the whole time until it reduces to about a third of the amount. Doing this will cause the vinegar to be thicker and concentrate the flavor, which is exactly what we want. All right, so now that the mozzarella has been melted on the bread, you have your basil and your tomato ready to um, dress up those bruschetta, let's do that. So on each bruschetta, put the basil, the sliced basil on each piece of bread with mozzarella, and then add about a tablespoon, depending on the size of your baguette slices, tablespoon of diced tomatoes, and then drizzle just ever so faintly a little bit of balsamic vinaigrette on each slice. And that is it. So simple. Serve immediately because you want them to eat them warm when the cheese is ooey and gooey and pair with wine of your choice. I've served this year round and it never seems to be out of season. I know tomatoes are the best in the summer, um, but definitely something to keep in your arsenal for those simple little appetizers when you need them um, for a get together parties or simply want a snack. All right. The recipe will be on today's show notes, www.thesimplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast eight. So you can grab all those ingredients and, and, uh, the directions on the show notes as well as see a brief little image, um, of my own cooking experience with those. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each Monday's podcast, where I'll recommend a book, a film, a recipe, or from time to time, introduce you to an expert who offers insight into how to live simply, luxuriously, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast. For more ideas and inspiration, stop by the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com, or subscribe to the weekly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox every Friday to help you stay caught up on the most recent podcasts and blog posts. Until next Monday, bonjour!